Hi, in this video we're going to revisit the Fieldtech FY6900 Arbitrary Waveform Generator. So if you watched my review on this item, you'll know that I was actually uh, really impressed with the overall uh, performance and general operation. The main criticism I had, as with the previous Arbitrary Waveform Generator that I had from Fieldtech, it was the power supply section. So I had quite a few requests to update the design. And in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to take a few measurements, just check the outputs from here. We can certainly make some assumptions on what the current requirements are for on each rail. And then what we're actually going to do is go through the whole design process. So we're going to go on the parametric search and look for suitable uh, parts to use on the power supply PCB. We'll hopefully get to the point where we are designing the schematic in the PCBs. And then once we've designed the PCBs, we'll go onto the JLC PCB website where we can order PCBs starting from $2 for five boards in any color. And then the overall plan is to publish the Gerber files and the bill of materials list so that anyone who wants to replicate this can do so. So first of all, we're just gonna check the power supply rails. So this waveform generator is designed to output 24 volt peak to peak signals on the BNC connectors. So we're going to need the positive and negative rails for the analog outputs. And then we've also got some logic power supplies, so the 5 volt here. So it's actually written on the power supply what the rails are. I just want to double check that these are actually true because for a 24 volt peak to peak signal, you'd normally expect some amount of headroom on the power supply to account for the fact that some op amps and some of the electronics in the signal path is going to reduce the amplitude of voltage available. So what we'll do is we'll get the digital multimeter and just measure the rails directly. Right, so we've got this powered up now, so we do need to be a little bit careful not to touch anything on the main side. Uh, so let's uh, start measuring what the voltage rails are. So I've got my black probe in the zero volts. According to the markings on the PCB, we should now have five volts on here. And we're just reading very slightly high, so 5.25 volts. The next one should be 5 volts as well. Yeah. And then we should have a plus 12 and minus 12 volts. And we're reading 13.5 and minus 13.5. So that is uh, more like what I expected. Uh, that just gives uh, one and a half volts either side just for any losses um, in the op amps and that kind of thing. What I'll just do is I'll grab a 50 ohm terminator to put on one of the outputs and just check that that voltage doesn't drop at all. Right, so we're now dumping quite a lot of power into one of the outputs. So let's see if the voltage rails have changed at all. So we're now reading 13.4 and about minus 13.4 as well. So that's relatively stable at um, about 13 and a half volts. So that means that we need to design our circuit for plus or minus 13.5 volts, and then also have our five volt rail. So we can grab our calculator. We know it's gonna be 24 volts into 50 ohm load at worst case, that's 480 milliamps. And then we've got two channels of that. So we're basically looking at one amp for the 13 and a half volt plus and minus volt rails. And then we've also got a five volt rail and that's really only gonna be driving the logic and the LCD on the front panel. And just by inspection of what's on the PCB and the sort of stuff that's on here, we know that's only gonna be a couple of hundred milliamps, but we can very easily design a one amp five volt rail. So uh, I think that's what we're gonna do there. So let's uh, go onto the computer and then start looking at some potential parts that we could use. So I think what the plan is going to be is we're going to use a commercially available AC to DC converter to get our 24 volt or 12 volt supply from the AC mains. And then our output from that is going to be what we design our circuit around. So let's say we're going to feed in 24 volts DC. We then need to get our three power supply rails from that. Now, because we have one negative rail, we are inherently going to have to use a switch mode regulator of some kind to get that negative rail because we can't use linear power supplies to get a negative supply from a 24 volt supply. So we're going to have to use a switch mode regulator for that. And I'm thinking that we'll probably use switch mode regulators for all three supplies 
If you watched my videos on the other FieldTech signal generator, it was quite a few years ago now, I designed a linear power supply for that around some transformers and we had linear regulators and the main problem with that is uh, these kind of currents will get into the point where we're dissipating quite a lot of heat. So I'm thinking that we're going to use all switch mode regulators in this design. The only thing that we might think about doing is having a linear regulator stage after the switch mode regulators to clean up the supplies and get rid of any noise. So I'm on um, the Texas Instrument website at the moment. And what we're going to do is we're just going to have a little look at some of the devices that we could use. Now, we could go through the parametric search, but I think what we're actually going to do is there is a Webbench designer which you can use on here to down select from all of the power supply chips that are on there to some of the most likely suspects. So we'll start off by doing that. We're first of all going to look at the negative supply rail. So let's have a look. So here I am on the power management page and you can see here there's a section here that just says power quick search. So let's say we're just going to put in our nominal 24 volt supply and from that we want our minus 13 and a half volts. And I said that we needed at least one amp. Let's say we're going to design it for a 1.5 amp supply. We'll click search and see what it comes up with. So we've got quite a few different chips here. The LM2676, this is highlighted because I've actually used this recently on another design. And it's a really simple DC to DC converter. And it's relatively cheap in volume, so $1.80 and not too bad. Unfortunately, you can't design with this part in Webbench Designer. So we're not going to be able to do any simulations with this, but it's such a simple part, it's very tempting to just use that straight off because you really only need an inductor, a few resistors and some capacitors and the design just works. The simple switcher range of DC to DC converters is really good, uh, especially for beginners that don't know quite what they're looking at with some of the graphs in Webbench Designer. So we do have some other options. We've got the LM25576, which is in an SSOP package. It's slightly more expensive, and I think this will need quite a few more components. We can have a little look at that in a moment. The LM5576 is effectively the same device. Uh, I think it's just designed for automotive use. It has a slightly wider voltage range. We do have some power modules. So uh, we're looking at integrated switch solutions at the top. Those just need inductors and passives around it. The power module has everything internal and you maybe just have to have your feedback network external to it. So it's got all the transistors, the inductors, everything in there. And then we've got a controller. So we've got one option here as a controller. This is literally just the controller and you have to add your external transistors, uh, inductors and all of the passives around it. So just looking at these, these are all uh, simple switches. These are very easy to design with. Uh, and then we've just got these other parts here. Let's have a little look at the LM25576. And we can have a little look at the data sheet. There's a block diagram here, but we'll look at the data sheet quickly and see what's going on. So this has a built-in MOSFET. It's designed for quite a wide voltage range. Um, I'm not sure if it specifies anything specific here about uh, negative inverting rails. Let's have a little look. So this is our functional block diagram. This gives us an indication of how this device is working and these are really useful uh, to see if they're going to be suitable for your design. So this is fairly conventional in its operation. Slightly more complex device than the simple switcher in terms of external components. Let's have a little look, further look into the datasheet. So it describes all of the operation of the internal blocks. Just trying to see what it says about inverting operation because generally it's quite simple to design the standard book regulator circuits and you'll get a whole load of uh, formulas. But uh, for the inverting arrangement, they don't always go into detail in the data sheet, which is just what I'm looking for now. So we've got a little bit of detail here on a book and boost inverting application. It's actually just directing you to using Webbench. So let's fire up Webbench and have a little look. So here we are in Webbench and what we're going to look at is the DC to DC power design. So we'll click start design and Webbench is available on the TI website. So you just click on the link, sign in and then you can use the web based tool. 
Let's just start off with uh, putting in a 24 volt supply. Our output wants to be minus 13 and a half on our output current as 1.5 amps. And then you can click view designs. And actually, it doesn't have that part on here, which suggests that it probably didn't manage to find a suitable operating point for that part. We can just try playing around with the output settings, just in case it is there. Right, so it's just about finished loading those up. It still hasn't come up with uh, one with the integrated switch. So um, you can see here we've got some of the ones with the controller, and you can see everything is external to the chip. We've got our MOSFET our bootstrapping capacitor, diodes, inductors, everything's external. Uh, but we don't seem to have that part, so it doesn't look like it's able to come up with a suitable solution using that other part. So it looks like we're going to go down the line of using one of the simple switcher ICs. So let's take a closer look at that. Right, so here we are back on the TI page, and we're just going to take a look at the LM2676. So uh, here we can see it's in a nice chunky surface mount package. Let's have a look at the data sheet. And this one is available in 3.3, 5 and 12 volt fixed versions or an adjustable output version. So we are going to need the adjustable output version to get our 13 and a half volt supply. And here's our typical schematic. So that looks pretty simple. You can see we really only need some capacitors our flyback diode inductor and an output capacitor, and then also this um, bootstrapping capacitor. So really not a lot of parts on here. This makes the design very simple, which is why we don't need to use Webbench to simulate this, because there's no compensation network to design. Uh, I think the phase margin and everything is controlled by the chip itself. So this is the typical positive output supply version. Let's have a little look. Uh, see if it explains anything about negative supplies. So we'll look at section 8, application and implementation. So uh, we'll just have a little look through and see if it mentions anything about negative supplies, about our capacitors, diodes, what boost capacitors. So they typically do have recommendations for certain components that you want to use around the uh, part in question. So it'll often specify very specific ceramic capacitors or something similar to make sure that you get the performance that is expected from the data that's in the data sheet. Um, so we've got another application here. So this is our positive five volt supply. And then this section is really useful. So this is the part that you need to read. And this tells you all the steps that you need to go through in order to design your DC to DC converter. So this is TI are very good for doing this. You always get your step-by-step -step instructions. So to find the power supply operating conditions, we know what those are. Um, select which particular variant you need of the switch mode chip, then choose your inductors, and then use the tables to come up with the rest of the components around it. So actually all of the hard work is done for you by TI already. Okay, so it doesn't seem to have anything about inverting suppliers. Let's take another look at the page. And there often is some kind of app note or something which says how to use them in different configurations. Let's have a look at the technical documents. And we've got some application notes here. Oh, there we go. So we've got an application note here, positive to negative buck boost converter using the uh, LM267 range of simple switches. So we'll have a look at that. Okay, and they've got the configuration here for using it as an inverting converter. So you can see that we're using the chip in a slightly different topology. And here we go, this is our application circuit that we need. So we've got our input on the side here, V in, and then the output is actually referenced to ground. So we've got a little ground symbol. So we know that that's connected to here. And then we've got our negative supply coming out here. So that's what we need to know. Let's see if we've got any uh, further details on how to calculate our parts. So we've got details on how to design for our specific inductors. Capacitor output selection, diode ratings. 
and then they've got an example here. So this is really useful because you can quickly check your calculations to make sure that they match up with uh, what TI have said. So uh, they're giving you all an example, a worked through example, so you can check all of your own sums. Right, so I've just finished going through the data sheet and the application note, and in particular, um, some of the details around the inductor selection, just checking that this chip is going to be suitable for our design. So basically, what this section is, is our simple calculations that we did at university in our power converters module. And basically what we're doing is working out the inductor value, the inductor current, the peak inductor current, and also the duty cycle. So first of all, we start off working out the duty cycle. Uh, so I've just done them in Word. Let me just bring that up. There we go. So uh, the duty cycle is basically the amount of time that the transistor is going to be turned on for to get our output voltage that we need. So we just do the simple uh, output voltage plus the voltage drop of the Schottky diode divided by the incoming supply voltage plus the output voltage because this is an inverting regulator, you add those two together and then add in the two diodes as well and that gives us our duty cycle of about 0.373 which is absolutely fine. That's a nice short period and we've got plenty of control around there uh, for any uh, small changes in our input voltage. Then we can work out the inductor current. Now because we're conserving power, in the time that the transistor is on, which is a much shorter period of time compared to the continuous uh, waveform, the current during that time where the transistor is on uh, results in a much higher current flow. So we can work out what the peak inductor current is in that period by um, just dividing our average current by the duty cycle. That gives us 2.4 amps. So uh, that all makes sense. Uh, and then we can work out um, what the peak-to-peak -peak inductor ripple current is. So it suggests in the application note that we should use a value of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Uh, to work out this value, we've just picked 0 0.2. And that gives our peak-to-peak -peak inductor ripple current of 0.48 amps at maximum current. And then we can do our E equals L di by dt calculation, which is the standard for um, working out our inductor values. It's just been rearranged slightly here, and that gives us an, an approximate value of 72 microhenries. That's not going to be a standard value. I think probably the nearest is going to be 68 or maybe 82. Uh, we can make a compromise later. Um, depending on uh, which one makes the most sense. And then it also gives a formula here to work out the volt second rating of the inductor. So that's just making sure that the inductor is even capable of uh, delivering that current in that period of time. Then finally, uh, you just have to work out the maximum switch current to make sure that we're not going to damage the device. So this has a 3 amp switch in it. And from this calculation, we can see that our maximum current that we're going to have through that switch is 2.64 amps if the full 1.5 amps is being drawn. Now, as we know, actually the current is going to be less than that in this design anyway, so this is well within what we need it to be. So uh, this looks like it should be suitable. So the next thing that we want to do is just check that we can even get this part and that the price is reasonable because um, I've probably done this slightly in the wrong order. You do want to make sure that you can get the part I've been through countless times where you've thought you found the absolutely perfect part and it's only available from one distributor and they've only got a few left or something um, and it always catches you out. So um, that's the next thing we should have a look at. So we're going to be looking at uh, a few different distributors. We'll just check Farnell first. And we're looking for the LM2676 simple switcher. And I can already see that it's available here. So we want the adjustable version in this power package. And here it is. So they've got a ton in stock. It's about £5 from here. Let's check RS. And yeah, we've got the adjustable version here, £4.28. And we'll also check LCSC, because that's probably where I'm going to end up getting it from. Uh, 2676 adjustable lead free and $2.83 and from past experience 
these were genuine parts from LCSC, so this is a good price. Uh, so that's good. So we know we're going to use this part for the negative supply, and we may as well use it for the positive supply as well. That keeps our component count low. And we could even use it as our 5 volt supply as well. So we've actually got a fixed voltage version available, the 5 volt version. Um, we probably could just use the same one as well for the 5 volt rail. We will have a quick look just to see if there's anything more suitable. Um, but actually it probably doesn't make sense to use anything else. Let's have a little look. So we'll go back to the TI page and we've got a whole lot more options available. So 72 different ones with an integrated switch. So we possibly could use something else, slightly lower cost versions. Uh, you know, we're coming in at less than $2 for the bill of materials. For this device, I'm not too concerned about the price overall. It's going to be a one-off. Um, obviously, it is adding to the cost of the signal generator in the first place, so uh, we've got to bear that in mind. But uh, those simple switches are easily available, as you saw, so uh, anyone who wants to build this is going to be able to find those quite easily. Let's have a little look. So I have used the TPS5410 before. Let's have a little look at this quickly. So this is an SO8 package, wide input range, so still got the voltage range that we want on the input. Let's have a little look at the data sheet. And this is actually a really simple design as well, so it doesn't really need any components. You can see here, we just use our chip the flyback diode, the inductor, and this one has a feedback network because this is a fully adjustable output version. So it's te possibly tempting to use something else. Um, let's have a look at the pricing again. Yeah, I think we're just going to use the same one, uh, possibly even the same adjustable version for the whole lot, just keep one part in the um, bill of materials. Right, so I had to stop recording last night, so we're back at it again today. And I've just gone through and done all of the calculations for the inductors for all of the voltage rails. So I think we did the negative 13.5 volt rail last night. Then we've got the positive 13.5 volt rail. And the calculations are the standard book regulator calculations this time because this is uh, not an inverting configuration. So we've got a duty cycle of 0 0.56. And then we can either do the inductor calculation or we can look at the nomograph which it provides in the data sheet. And you can see here, if we follow the red line, we're at about 68 microhenries. The calculation comes out as 76. Uh, but they're recommending 68. They haven't put 82 on here for some reason, so they've just stuck with the most common values. And this pretty much gets you there without having to do all of the calculations. Then finally on the 13.5 volt rail, we just need to check that the switch current is less than the 3 amp maximum for this part. And it comes out as 1.65 amps, so that's absolutely fine. And then finally for the 5 volt regulator, uh, our duty cycle is obviously much less because we're just um, chopping up that 24 volt into a 5 volt uh, rail. That gives us a duty cycle of 0 0.2. The inductor ripple current 0 0.2 amps. Then we've got a choice of two different nomographs to use because there is a fixed output voltage version available. And that's the one on the left here. So if we look with our 24 volt in and 1 amp, that recommends 47 microhenries. Or we can use the adjustable regulator nomograph. You do have to calculate the volt second rating of the inductor. That comes out as 16.32. So if we look on the graph here, it comes out as 47 microhenries as well. So we've got 47 microhenries for um, the 5 volt regulator and the switch current comes out as 1.1 amps. So um, that's all of those parts um, all okay. What we need to do now is just work out firstly what inductor to use. So now that we've got a inductor value, how on earth do we go about selecting a suitable inductor from the hundreds of thousands that are available on Farnell or whatever? So we're going to run through that. Also, we do need to just work out the capacitor values to you. So there's some detailed design procedures in the data sheet. And it says, uh, first of all, determine the inductor. So we've done all of that. So next we want to work out the capacitor values to use and it's saying use table 5 or table 6. So we'll go to table 5 and this is for surface mount parts, table 6 is for through hole capacitors. We're going to be using surface mount parts. 
And first of all, for the 5 volt rail, we know we're using a 47 mic uh, inductor, 5 volt output. So it's saying use 2 of C2 if we're using the AVX TPS series, or if we use Kemet T495, it's saying use 2 of C4. So let's look at the AVX TPS. And so for surface mount parts, C2, we want to be using two lots of 100 microfarad 10 working voltage with a ripple current of 1.1 amps. So let's have a little look at LCSC and we'll type in AVX TPS 100 microfarad 10 volt. Let's see if that comes up with anything on here. So these are tantalum capacitors and that's the part that we need actually. So if we have a look at this, it's the TPS series, 100 mic and 10 volts. We can just quickly check the data sheet, see if it mentions the maximum ripple current and the RMS current maximum at 85C is 1.1, which is what we need. So we know we're going to need this part. Um, so that's the part for the 5 volt rail. Let's take another look at the other rails. So if we have another look at this, we need to use different tables for the adjustable rails. So in our output voltage is between 12.5 and 15 and our inductance value was 68. So it's saying here we can use one of C6. And that's a 33 microfarad, 20 working volt, uh, 0.77 amp. So we can have another look on LCSC for that part. And there's our part that we need. And for the negative rail, we can just use the same capacitor as the positive 13 and half volt rail. So that's the same part here. And then we just need to choose the input capacitors. So it says go, go to table seven. And for the five volt rail, uh, we use two of C12. So that's recommending two 4.7 microfarad 50 volt capacitors. Right, so it looks like LCSC don't actually have all of the input capacitors that we're going to need. But the main factor for the input capacitance is the ESR value. The capacitance is somewhat secondary, especially when we're going to have the AC to DC converter in close proximity. So what we're actually going to do is for the design, we'll just put a, um, a whole bank of low ESR capacitors along with some ceramic capacitors to uh, make up the shortfall. And that will be uh, sufficient for our application. So the final bit is to look for appropriate inductors and let's have a look what it recommends in terms of inductor selection. So it says table three has some recommendations for uh, particular types of inductors. So coil craft, pulse engineering, Renko. I tend to use coil craft where possible. So let's have a little look at some of these parts. So for the negative 13 and a half volt rail, we know we need to use something around 72 microhenries. So with our inductor current of two and a half amps, it looks like we're narrowing our selection slightly. We're, if we want surface mount, which we do really, it looks like we're gonna to have to search for this part. So let's see if anyone has this. First of all, we'll just search LCSC. Uh, they don't have anything there. Let's have a general search. Mauser, DigiKey, and nothing else really. So let's have a look to see if we can find the part manually. So 68 microhenries. And again, we want greater than three amps. Let's see what we've got in the selection here. It looks like we've got one. Little look at this, this looks about right. 
right kind of size for the power that we need, so 12.5 millimetres. Saturation current 3.5 amps, so that's absolutely fine. The saturation current is the point where the core starts to saturate and therefore it won't be storing any more energy and we know that we're way less than that. And then we can just check its behaviour. So at 3.5 amps you can see that's where the inductance starts to drop, drop as it saturates and we're going to be at about... 200 kilohertz, so our inductance is fairly stable at that point. So I think this looks like a suitable candidate for um, the inverting regulator, so I'll just note down that part number. Next for our 13.5 volt rail, we need something in the 68 microhenry range with a um, saturation current. So we've got slightly more current going on here, we probably need something slightly chunkier. And so I actually just realised that I did the calculation slightly wrong. The inductor current is only 2.66 amps uh, for a book regulator. So therefore we can use exactly the same inductor for the two rails. Finally, we just need to look at the inductor for the 5 volt rail. And so it's recommending a 47 microhenry. So let's go back to the data sheet. 47 microhenry with a current of, so this one looks like it should be fine. Let's see if we can find this part. Otherwise, we'll use one from the same range as before. Try the pulse engineering. Looks like we may have to select an alternate part again. No, it's a no look with that. So what we can uh, probably do is look back at the parametric search on LCSC. And so we're looking at 47 microhenries. Got one here, 2.1 amps. And oddly, not much else. So let's have a look what we come up with here. And there we go. So that looks like a suitable part. 10 by 10 by 4, so approximately the right size for what we're doing here. Just quickly check how it behaves at the switching frequency. And they haven't actually put all of the graphs as previous, so let's have a little look. Right, so it looks like that this inductor might be a better choice for the 5 volt rail. It's slightly higher rated in terms of current. We've got a nice low DC resistance and our inductance is fine. So we'll use this part for the 5 volt rail. Finally, we need to choose a suitable diode. So I've just gone to the shock key barrier diode section on LCSC. And we know that our current rating wants to be greater than 3 amps, which is... Um, the switch rating of the switch mode regulator chip and we need something greater than the maximum voltage that we're going to see across the diode is worst case with the inverting configuration so that's 24 volts plus 13 and a half so let's see what we've got in the 50 volt and higher region and so we've got quite a lot of selection here uh, let's see if we can go for a slightly more well-known brand. So we've got Diodes Inc. And we obviously want one that's in stock as well. And we've got 17 to choose from. So let's see if we can see what's different between all of these. Uh, working voltage... So our forward voltage is probably something that we want to take a look at. Uh, let's have a look and see what the lowest one here is. So we've got one 620 millivolts at 7 amps. Let's have a look and see what that is. That's the, this part. Let's have a little look at the data sheet for it. So 60 volts reverse voltage for the peak, 42 um, for RMS, 7 amps, so way more than what we need. And we're typically looking at, so it's got a value here for 3.5 amps, 
we're going to see about 0 0.5 volts drop, which is actually what we used in our calculations. So this certainly looks like a suitable contender. We'll just check whether there's anything in uh, SMC type package, because I know I already have that in my PCB design software. So this one's in an SMA package. Let's just check the data sheet on this one. So similar forward voltage drop, just very slightly higher. I think we could probably use either of these. So uh, let's go with the uh, slightly bigger one. It's got a um, slightly bigger footprint with better thermal management. You can see we've got this nice big heatsink pad on the back. So the diode's going to be dissipating its power a little bit easier. So I think we'll go with this one. And there's plenty in stock. So uh, by the time I order this, we shouldn't uh, run out. So we pretty much designed that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm not going to bore you with drawing the schematic. We'll rejoin you at the point where I'm laying out the PCB. You can just look at some of the uh, compromises and some of the design choices when we're laying out that board. Right, so I've just about finished the schematic now and I've made a few changes whilst drawing this up while I was thinking things through. First of all, the tantalum capacitors that we were talking about for the input and output capacitors on the DC to DC converters, I've now swapped out for a combination of electrolytic capacitors and ceramic capacitors. And the main reason there is because tantalum capacitors do fail generally quite spectacularly, either from old age or when they're subject to high ripple currents that decreases the life of them considerably. So I thought I'd just eliminate those altogether. We do still have electrolytics on there, but they're easy to swap out and they don't tend to fail so catastrophically. The other thing that I've done is I've added in a couple of linear regulators on the analog output. So let's have a little look at what's going on the schematic. So first of all, what we've got is our 24 volt input. And we're just using a P-channel MOSFET here for reverse polarity protection. So what happens is there is a body diode in here. Um, so normally what would happen is you get your 24 volts coming in through that body diode and then through here. And once we've got enough voltage at that point, the gate turns on and we uh, are able to sync all of the available current into our circuit. If the 24 volt supply is reversed, that body diode never starts conducting and therefore the MOSFET is never actually able to turn on because uh, these nodes never get to the correct voltage uh, to turn on this MOSFET. So that stops the rest of the circuit from being damaged. Then first of all we've got our 20, uh, 5 volt supply and here you can see I've gone for the combination of electrolytic and ceramic capacitors. So we've got uh, quite a bit of capacitance on here. Uh, we don't necessarily have to fit all of these but it's always worthwhile putting the footprints on if there's space. So we've got some 2.2 microfarad ceramics along with one 220 microfarad electrolytic going into our LM2676 regulator. Then we've got our bootstrapping capacitor. The value from this just comes straight from the data sheet. So 10 nanofarad is the uh, correct value to use here. We've got the diode that we chose and the inductor that we chose along with a feedback network. And I've just realized I haven't put in the correct value here, 3.16K. So I've done a little calculation next to each node just so that when we refer back to the schematic at some point in the future, we know why we did that. And then we've got some capacitors on the output and that goes straight out to our terminal block, which is going to go off to the other board. We've also got an LED just to indicate that power is coming out of there. Then we've got our 13 and a half volt supply, basically the same situation. But then on this section here, I've added in some linear post regulation. So we're going to be using an LM317 to get our regulated supply. So what that means is the output from our DC to DC converter actually needs to be a little bit higher. Uh, typically for the LM317, it recommends that there is a differential voltage between input and output of around two and a half volts minimum. So we've raised this node up to 16 volts. That's just affected the feedback resistors in the network here, but uh, nothing else really. Uh, you know, we didn't have to change the inductor or anything like that. So that's all okay. And then we just got our LM317 with our resistor feedback network, which gives us 13 and a half volts. And then we've just got the LED again, and then an output to our terminal block. And we've got pretty much the same story on the negative supply. 
The negative supply is slightly different because we're using the DC to DC in a different arrangement. So it looks slightly odd. We don't actually have a ground connection to the ground pin. The ground actually comes from uh, where would normally be our voltage supply rail. And then down here we've got an LM337, which is the complement of LM317 for negative supplies. I was looking if there are any lower noise linear regulators easily available, and there are for the positive supplies, but actually there's a very limited supply of uh, different types of linear regulators with a reasonably high current rating for negative supplies. So I think we've just gone with the LM317, LM337 combination. And the idea is that this will clean up some of the switching noise. Now there is a app note, um, I think it's a linear app note, which has all of the details about uh, potential ways to clean up switching regulators. Uh, one of those is to um, have a linear supply at the end. And in a video in the future, I may well cover this in a bit more detail as to how it can reduce uh, some of the noise. But uh, that's basically uh, just giving us our slightly lower noise supply so that we don't see that on the output of the signal generator. So that's pretty much the schematic. And I was also just having a little look on LCSC and I have found a little AC to DC module which I'm thinking of using. So although uh, we have designed these supplies for up to 1.5 amps each, we know that the maximum was going to be uh, about one amp or half an amp for each channel on the signal generator. The other thing to note is that with the signal generator, we're creating a bipolar waveforms. So what that actually means is half of that current is shared uh, with the negative supply and with the positive supply. So we can never have all of the current being drawn on negative and positive supply simultaneously. Therefore, the maximum current that we actually need on the um, input side is half of what we're designing for on the output. Um, so I found a couple of different power supplies. Let's see if we can uh, bring it up on LCSC. Right, so here's the AC to DC converter, which I'm thinking of possibly using. It's a Monson LH2513B24. And so this gives us our 24 volt, 1.1 amp output from a mains input into this device. And it's a relatively compact module. So if we scroll down to the bottom here, uh, we've got the dimensions here. So 70 millimeters by 48 millimeters. So that will actually fit inside the box. Um, so what we'll have a look at in a minute is the PCB layout and how it might possibly fit on that board because it's a board mounted device and it would make it uh, really nice and compact and all self-contained. We do, do still have the option of having a DC connector and then having an external power brick. But the problem is that we've already got an IEC connector and power switch on the back of the device. Um, so it would be nice to continue using those. So let's have a little look at the PCB layout. So the first thing to do when you're about to lay out a PCB is to sort out all of the mechanical features. So here you can see I've drawn the PCB outline and we've got four holes for mounting screws. And then there's a little section here that says restricted height area. So if I just grab the uh, unit itself, you might just be able to see it. Um, we've got this whole section here available for the power supply. And on this side, we've got the IEC connector, which just encroaches on the PCB area available. So um, I've just marked that up on the PCB. And then there's the four mounting points, which we're gonna continue using. Those are the same ones that the original PCB was mounted on. So it makes sense just to screw it into those. It's got some self-tapping screws and we'll just uh, screw in the PCB that way. And then this blue box here is that uh, power module. And I've just put it on the PCB for now. And if we can design all of the rest of the circuitry around it and have it looking quite neat, then we'll stick it basically where it is on the drawing there. Otherwise, I think what we'll do is we'll create a little riser board. We'll have a separate PCB with that power module in it because we've got quite a lot of room inside the case. Um, so we could um, just have a double stack of boards. It doesn't need to be the same full size, um, but just one for the power module. And then that also means that if you decide, if you do end up building one of these PCBs and you decide not to use that module, uh, we haven't got a big bit of wasted space on the board. So uh, we'll have a little look at that soon. But the most important thing is to get the mechanical features sorted so that you know where the screw holes are and where the PCB outline is going to be. That means that then when you start laying out all of the components, you're not going to come a cropper um, 
once you try and you know fit it into the casework and realize oh I need some screws there um, we're going to have to uh, rejig all of the circuitry. So I'm just going to start laying out some of the parts and what really we want to do is try and create quite a logical um, layout. So the first thing that we can do immediately is just start laying out the circuitry directly around the DC to DC converters. And if we have a look in the data sheet, there's usually a recommended layout. So uh, this is our adjustable output version. And they normally give some kind of example. So they're given a bit of information here so, so that you can understand the potential pitfalls in your layout. You want to keep some of the loop areas quite small. So it's telling you where the current flow is in the design. And then what they've done here is they've actually recommended a specific layout. So it does make sense to copy this as far as possible because generally this has been optimized uh, by TI for the best operation and the lowest EMI. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create one layout of this for the 5 volt rail and see if we can get everything as tight as possible. And that will give me an idea for how much room the DC to DC is going to take up on the PCB. And then we can assume that for the three rails, it's going to be three times that plus the two linear regulators. And then we'll get a good idea whether we're going to be able to fit this all on the PCB with that big power module in place or whether we need to have another board. Right, so I've just finished putting uh, clusters of components together. So this is generally the first stage of things that I do. So I normally put all of the components pretty much in the position that I want. And then the routing is nice and quick after that. So you get a feel for where you want the parts. Again, we're somewhat copying the recommended layout for the DC to DC converter part of the circuit. But uh, we've got our little blocks here. And as you can probably see, we're going to be fairly tight on space if we want to be able to fit this on the PCB as well. So we've kind of got this area here available and that's looking fairly tight. Uh, it might be possible to just about squeeze it in. What I do want to do is these are the two linear regulators here and I want to keep these in line and clear of all the other components so that I can just run a little heat sink across the two parts. So I don't want uh, the heat sink fouling on anything else. Let's have a look and see if we can do anything with it. So ideally we'd have these up here somewhere. And that just about fits on there. We can possibly uh, get things a little bit closer together. But then we've got to get this 5 volt rail in here as well. And I think on this side of this circuit is going to be uh, where the mains comes in on that unit. Um, so really we want to either keep it just here or we do have a little bit of space up in this top corner. So let's see if we can uh, get that in there as well. The trouble is the mounting holes here are causing the problems. And that's why it's really important to get all of the mechanical features in first. Because obviously you can see now uh, that that is causing a trouble. I'm um, just wondering if we can flip this around and maybe get the converter in this area here. Um, yeah, I think it's going to need a little bit of playing around. Uh, and if this doesn't work, then I think we'll have to go for the two layer board approach. So I've been having a little play around with various different layouts and all that kind of thing. I think it's going to work out best if we separate out the AC power module from the DC to DC converters. That way, uh, all of the AC stuff is away from here. Also, it gives us a lot more freedom on the layout to make a more optimal layout that actually makes sense. The other thing is, if, we, um, if anyone does make one of these PCBs, you're then not tied to using that particular power module. You can use any 24 volt supply that you like. So um, I've added a few extra holes and these are going to be duplicated on the second board and that means that we can just tie the two boards together with some spacers and I've got all my labels everywhere along with a few test points so that we can check the various voltages when we're bringing up the PCB. So the next thing is to start routing and what I'd normally do is I'd start tracking out all of the easy to route parts, do all of that and then start looking at um, everything else. Now, typically, I would start off with all of the signals that uh, need to be carefully routed. So those would be the first to get priority. 
then all of the simple routing next, and then typically I'd make sure at the end I then do the ground pour and the power planes and whatever else that we need uh, to get power to the, to the various devices. And I tend to leave that until last because that's generally the easier job with multi-layer PCBs. When obviously you've only got one layer, um, as you would do if you were making PCBs at home, then you probably want to prioritise power to some extent. But uh, on a PCB like this, basically we can do all of the routing of uh, all of these little bits. You can see that's not going to interfere with anything. Then do a ground copper pour and then see what else needs doing. So I'm going to start doing that and I'll rejoin you uh, at the next stage. Right, so that's pretty much most of the routing done. You can see there's still some of the rat's nest up there. And that's because we now want to add the power plane. So we should just be able to go to a power plane generator. And we want a copper pour on the top copper. That's going to be ground at the top. And we just need to check the properties here. So top copper, uh, default boundary. We need to make sure that the thermal reliefs are enabled. That stops all of the heat being taken away ground, around the ground plane when you're trying to solder some of the parts that sit on the ground plane. And yeah, I think everything's okay as default. Then we can create the bottom ground pour. And that's our 24 volt incoming feed. Right, so I've just tidied a few bits up, but I think we're pretty much done. So the next thing to do is run a design rule check. So we can just do pre-production check and just check whether there's any violations. There we go, so everything is looking good there. And then we can create our Gerber files. So actually it already runs the DRC check when you're about to export Gerbers. And then uh, it's going to put it in the folder where I've got all of the files. We want to make sure that we've got uh, all of the layers set up correctly. So we don't need Mechanical 2. Uh, the board outline will be done automatically. Uh, we've got no silk on the bottom, so I think that's everything correct. And we can generate them, and that's done. You can also just quickly check what the board's going to look like. It does a rough render of what the PCB is going to look like in Proteus. You can do better models than the ones that it's got on here. So for the components that I've added recently, it just kind of does some blocks or it doesn't even draw them at all. But that's effectively what the PCB is going to look like. Nothing on the bottom side other than a few traces. So next we can upload this to the JLC website and uh, place the order. Right, so here we are on the JLC PCB website and we want to quote now. Then we want to get to our Gerber files. So this is the FY6900 power supply. And then what it's going to do is upload the Gerber files and hopefully we should get a preview of what the board is going to look like. So we can just go to the Gerber viewer. That allows us to just double check that everything is as expected now that it's been uploaded. And there we go. So all of the features all look to be correct. And we can just quickly check whether there's any violations of JLC PCBs um, design rules. So two layers and we're okay for the trace width and spacing. Drill size minimum I think is 0.2 so we're fine with that. And then we've got our width and height which are obviously uh, no problem whatsoever. So we can go back to the quote page. And I think we're just going to leave this one in green. And with 1.6 millimetre thickness, there's no need for it to be any different. I will still go with the Immersion Gold finish. And I think that is all we need. I will create a stencil as well. And the way to create the stencil so that it's the same size as the PCB is to get these dimensions 82 by 122. And we want to put that in here. So 82 by 122. Sometimes you have to swap those around, it doesn't always pick it up properly. And there we go, so it's calculated the price as $31. Let's click Save to Cart. Then we can log in and place the order. So I just now need to complete the Power Module PCB 
And once I've completed that, then I'll place the order. And as soon as we get the PCBs back, we'll do the next stage of building up the boards and testing and verifying its operation. Now, I'm going to do a video in the next couple of days on how to do cuts and uh, slots in PCBs if you're ordering from JLC PCB. I often get a lot of questions how I created some of the cuts in previous PCBs that I've done. So I'll cover that in a video along with some information about creepage and clearance distances, particularly when you're using uh, voltages that are relatively high or dangerous uh, in comparison to uh, the rest of the stuff that's on the board. So we'll cover that in a video a little bit later this week. So hopefully you enjoyed this style of video. I probably won't do too many quite as long as this, but I thought it might be interesting just to cover the design aspects all the way from looking at data sheets, trying to select parts through to the PCB layout. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. But until next time, thanks for watching.